Live from Orlando, Florida, it's theCUBE. Covering ServiceNow, Knowledge17. Brought to you by ServiceNow. In 2004, Fred Luddy had a vision. He was the founder of ServiceNow, and his vision was to create software that was really simple to use, to automate workflows within organizations. Two years later, in 2006, was the first ServiceNow knowledge. He rented out a room at a hotel that could support 50 people. 30 minutes before that event, <laughs> nobody was in the room. By the time the time came to start the first ServiceNow knowledge, 85 people were in the room talking to each other about this transformation that was occurring in their business. And they started to talking to each other. Fred Luddy stepped back, stepped back and said, you know what, to have a successful conference, I just need to let people talk to each other. And here we are today in 2017, 15,000 people at the ServiceNow, ServiceNow Knowledge. Welcome to Orlando, everybody. My name is Dave Vellante and I'm here with my co-host, Jeff Frick. Uh, this is, I believe, our fifth knowledge, uh, Jeff. This is like a 14, 15, 16, 17, fourth or fifth, Okay, yeah. fourth, fourth knowledge. We started <laughs> at the Aria Hotel in Las Vegas with about 4,000 people and now we're up to 15,000. Uh, this is a story of a company uh, that did an IPO, uh, right around 100 million, brought in a, an excellent CEO, Frank Slootman. In six years, this company has exploded to $1.4 billion. They've got a, they're on a path to do $4 billion of revenue by 2020. They've got a $17 billion market cap. If you look at software companies over a billion dollars, there is no software company that's growing as fast as ServiceNow, 30 plus percent a year, and throwing off as much free cash flow as ServiceNow, growing at about 45%. So they are incomparable in terms of comparing to other software companies. They are on a tear, the stock price is up. Lo and behold, Frank Slootman, the CEO, is getting out at the top, uh, bringing in <laughs> new CEO, John Donahoe. I feel like it's, uh, you know, uh, uh, an NFL quarterback, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, uh, Bill Walsh handing the reins over to George Seifert, maybe, and, uh, and, and as I say, getting out at the top. Uh, John Donahoe, to Donahoe, totally different style. We're going to be talking to him on theCUBE, just finishing up his key, keynote now. But Jeff, here we are, our fourth year, I guess, at, uh, right, at right. Knowledge. And a pretty amazing transformation in this company. It is a pretty amazing transformation. You know, we talk a lot about, about big data and we talk a lot about cloud and, and many of the shows we go to, but we, we probably don't talk about enough and we, we are going to for the next three days is really the success of SaaS apps. And as I always like to joke, there's a 60 story building going up in downtown San Francisco that Salesforce is completing to show you the power of SaaS apps. And I think what the ServiceNow story is, is more of that same story. You know, they started out with a relatively simple idea uh, Fred wanted to make work easier, and he f started with the ITSM because that was an easy place to get going, but really it's about simplifying workflow in a SaaS application, letting people get work done easier, and then it's pretty interesting because now as you look around, Dave, the conference, they've got five bubbles or five balls or five posters to really symbolize how they've moved beyond just ITSM into HR, customer service, biz apps, and security, and applying the same foundation, the same method, the same software, to get after more and more of the workloads that are happening inside of the enterprise. From a company perspective, this story here is about execution. A company, as I said, I gave you, shared with you the financials. Um, they've penetrated the Global 2000. Over 50% of their uh, average contract value comes from the Global 2000. Uh, and there's significant upside uh, there as well. Uh, in addition, their average uh, uh, contract value is growing very dramatically. I was speaking to some customers and asking them, so what was your deal size when you first started with ServiceNow? They're like, oh, it was small. It was like $60,000 contracts. Now they have many, many customers, well over a million dollars. They have you know, several customers over $5 million. So this is a company that is um, largely focused on large organizations, but also governments and, and mid-sized companies. Uh, not small businesses yet, Jeff. I mean, you and I have been dying to get a hold of uh, service now for small business. They announced Express <laughs> a couple years ago, but what Express really was was a way for the large co larger companies to try, you know, get their feet wet before they really jump all in. Uh, so, you know, we are still waiting for that day, but in the meantime, ServiceNow has a lot to do. Um, as they say, their goal now is to be four billion by 2020. Uh, it feels like, you know, when we first covered ServiceNow knowledge, we said, wow, this company reminds us a lot of the early days of Salesforce. They've got this platform, you can develop on this platform, you know, call it PaaS or you know, whatever you want to call it, but 
We at the time said they're on a collision course with, with Salesforce. Now there's plenty of room for both of those companies in the marketplace. Salesforce obviously focused predominantly on Salesforce automation, service now really on workflow automation. But you can see those sort of two markets coming together. Right, People right. really, you know, we know Salesforce, we try to use it for a lot of different things. Right. And, and, um, and so, giant markets built on the cloud, um, built with flexibility to add you know, volumes. We started at, um, at problem change management, help desk type of things within IT service management, and we're seeing that expand dramatically. And one of the things that you've always emphasized, Jeff, is the ecosystem. Take us back to the early days of when we walked the floor of the original knowledge that we did, it was uh, you know, four or five years ago, the companies that you saw there are much different than what you see today. Right, and, and, but the passion is still the same, and that's why we've loved coming to this thing for so many years, is because it's one of the companies that has a real passion, and there was a shout out to Fred, which is where it all started. I, you know, I think uh, Frank did a great job continuing that, and now uh, clearly John is a, is a really polished guy, you know, did his time at Bain, eBay, which he talked about as a community-based environment, and that was, was built on the strength of it, but the other part in terms of their expansion, their TAM expansion, which is always a, a popular topic, is you know, you know John talked about IT living at the intersection of interconnectedness across departments, and they've really done a good job of leveraging that. And he talked about a simple you know HR onboarding process to highlight all the departments that are touched: security, facilities. You need to get your badge. You need to get your laptop. You need to get checked in. So they're leveraging this and coming up from the bottom. And we talk about IT being an agent of transformation and not a cost center. Well, what better way to do that than to continue to simplify all these basically mundane processes, but again, just start eating them up and pulling more and more processes into the ServiceNow platform. The key to success from a customer standpoint is to adopt a single CMDB and to adopt the service catalog. Jeff, when we first started following ServiceNow and we talked to the customers, not everybody was adopting a single CMDB. That was a very political sort of football. Um, when I talk to customers today, many more, the vast majority, and, and just anecdotally, have adopted the CMDB. What that gives the customer and service now is tons of leverage, because you essentially have that single source of the truth, and then you can use that as a ripple effect across all the other innovations that you drive with ServiceNow. So for example, you start with help desk and change management and, and, and problem management, and then you move on to maybe IT operations management and you're automating those tasks. Then you may move on to HR, you might move on to logistics or marketing. Um, you're now dealing with security. So the example, the perfect example that, that they often give is onboarding. Right, when right. you onboard a new employee, there's six or seven or eight departments that you have to talk to. There's, there's at least eight, nine, ten processes. You've got to order your laptop, you've got to get a phone, you've got to get your office, you've got to you know, get onboarded to HR. All these things that have to occur that are generally separate phone calls or you're walking down the hall. ServiceNow, when you on, on board, they give you the example, they're eating their own dog food. You, you, know, you go into the portal and you do all these things and it has a ripple effect because of that single CMDB throughout the organization. Uh, and so that's given ServiceNow a lot of leverage within these companies. What you hear from customers is, one, it's, it's complicated to in, install this stuff. And in the early days, especially, where there weren't as many uh, experts in ServiceNow. So it used to take a couple of years to implement this. Um, second is, your price is too high. You know, you hear that a lot. That's, I mean, if that's your biggest hurdle, you're in good shape. So what ServiceNow has to do, in my view, Jeff, is two things. One, it's got to tap the ecosystem, and you've seen companies like CSX, now DX Technology, uh, and, and Accenture, and others, KPMG, KPMG EY, join the fray. Right, you know, right. I always joke, the SIs love to eat at the trough. Well, ServiceNow is becoming a big, robust ecosystem with a giant TAM. So ServiceNow has to lean on those partners very heavily to go in and, and accelerate implementation, convey best practices. ServiceNow has a program called Inspire, which is a loss leader. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, one of the best freebies in the industry where they will go in and share best practice with their largest customers. Uh, and then doing that in conjunction with the SIs to accelerate adoption. On the, on the price side, this company, and I think John Donahoe is perfect for this, really has to, and I want to ask him about this, has to increasingly emphasize the value. I think to date, Jeff, it's been a comparison. Well, I can get this from 
you know, BMC for this much, or HP for this much, or you know, IBM's got versions of that, or other competitors in this space, ServiceNow is essentially, if their pricing has been compared to them, what they have to do is shift the conversation from, from cost and price to the value that they're delivering. Biggest surprise, you, you got to spend a, a little day kind of behind the, uh, behind the curtain in the analyst day. Biggest surprise that came out of that for you? Well, I don't know if it's a, sh a shocker, but it was certainly underscored, is the, the actual amount of upside that this company has. Um, because they have you know, penetrated the Global 2000 pretty substantially. Uh, but what struck me was their ability to add new capabilities and add, expand their TAM. You know, I think I wrote a piece in 2013 um, basically sizing the TAM. When, when ServiceNow first IPO'd, Gartner came out and said, this is a dead market, help desk is $8 billion market, where are they going? I followed that up with a piece that said, you know, this TAM is quite large, it's probably about 30 billion, and I, and I shared with the Wikibon audience how it could get there. I think I underestimated that. Yeah. I think the TAM is, is 60 to 100 billion dollars, and the reason is that ServiceNow is able, as Fred Luddy said when we first interviewed him, it's a platform. I took it out there and said, here it is. Right, and, right. They said, and the VC said, what can you do with it? He goes, anything. Right. And they said, well, we're not going to fund platforms, it. Right. right, and so what they've been doing now is adding modules, and one of the ones that I'm most excited about is security. And it's not competing with the FireEyes and the Palo Alto networks and the McAfee's. It's actually automating a lot of the response to security, automating the runbook, automating the, the incident response, uh, and, and doing so in a way that actually builds that ecosystem up and, and is the glue that hangs it together. So I guess the biggest eye opener for me, Jeff, I talked earlier about the revenue growth and the free cash flow growth for a billion dollar plus company what was surprising, the most, the biggest eye-opener or surprise to me was the sustainability, in my opinion, of that upside. Right, but, but, but if it works right, no one's going to give it up, and if the efficiencies are so much better, no one's going to give it up. And I, I just look at those other huge categories of enterprise software, right? There's CRM, which they're playing a little bit into, not coming at it from kind of a sales perspective, but coming at it from a customer management perspective. There's HR, which they're clearly going after. There's ERP, which they're probably not in a position to do in the immediate term, but there's still a lot of work getting done in uh, large enterprises that can use a, a significant amount of customization, automation, with a little big data twist in the back, and a real eye to the, the customer experience as the millennials more and more in the workforce and the expected behavior of enterprise apps needs to mirror more what we get on our phone. So I think they're in a pretty good position. Yeah, so ITSM is the core. Everything stems from that. That's sort of the mainspring. Uh, and really IT are their peeps, as Frank Slootman used to say. <laughs> ITOM, IT Operations Management, is another large and substantive business, not as big as ITSM, but bigger than the others. Customer service management is a new and growing area. Um, security is, a, is a, a, a huge upside, in my opinion, in security. HR, they've been at it for a while. We've talked to Jen Stroud many times, and, and that's a big growth area. So these line of business entries are what's going to power the growth of ServiceNow going forward. There's also M&A, we haven't talked about M&A. When we first walked around the, the ecosystem on the exhibit floor at the ARIA four or five years ago, what we saw were a number of companies that could fit right into the ServiceNow platform. So one of the most more prominent uh, companies that ServiceNow acquired was DX Continuum. It's a sort of a, a, an, an intelligent AI machine learning system and they're deploying that to help predict outages part of their IT operations management uh, service, and they'll use that elsewhere. So it's a very specific, you know, AI, we, we cover AI, we cover you know, autonomous vehicles and so forth, that's actually a great use case, but so much of AI is fuzzy, and so much of deep learning and machine learning is like, how is that applied? Well, predictive analytics to say, okay, this component is going to fail, you know, replace it, or move the work off of that server. That's a really tangible use uh, of AI. So we've seen ServiceNow use uh, m and now what it does when it, when it acquires a company, it, it has to go through cycles of re-platforming. ServiceNow doesn't just bolt on third-party products. Wait, right, basically right. it rebuilds them from scratch right, on right. the platform. Right, into the platform, which yeah. is what you have to do, which is you know, kind of part of what SaaS is, is all about, and in the early days of SaaS, there was a lot of 
you know, pushback because everybody thought they needed customization. Well, they didn't really need customization because you can't have 47 versions of the platform out there. What you need is the ability to configure and have great configurability, and that's what good platforms do, and that's what Fred tried to build, and oh, by the way, I got to get started, so I went with the ITSM. So I think they're in a great position, Dave, and you know, as we know, cloud economics, of which this is a big, giant application, get good as the thing gets bigger and bigger and absorbs more and more functionality. So again, interesting change of, of, of management. We're going to talk to John, really look forward to it fresh new energy, and uh, I think they're off to the well, off the races. They've been racing for a while. Some of the other things, let's talk about customers for a minute. So one of some of the things that I get from customers when I talk to them is, and again, again, uh, CMDB and, and service catalog, those are two critical. If you want to get the value out of service now, you got to implement those two things, you know, and others. Um, and, 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 but as well, this idea of, of of multi-instance allows you to upgrade at your own pace. What a lot of SaaS companies will do, and we know this as a customer of a lot of SaaS companies, they say, new upgrade coming, <clears throat> you know, beware, and boom, the function hits. Or, or it also oftentimes hits with a price increase. What ServiceNow claims is that because you're in a multi-instance as opposed to a multi-tenant environment, you can plan your upgrades. Uh, now, having said that, what a lot of customers will do is they will try to avoid custom mods, custom modifications, and they'll try to take ServiceNow function out of the box. The, the, the desirability of that is when a new upgrade comes, you don't have to worry about the modifications that you've made. However, it's not always that simple. I talked to a customer this morning on the way over here, and they're a big SAP user, and they're doing a lot of custom mods with their, uh, with their implementation. And I said, aren't you worried about that? Yes, we're very worried about that because that's going to be problematic for us when we upgrade, but they're, they're, they're wed to SAP. So, you know, my advice to customers is always tr try where possible to avoid custom modifications. You hear that a lot from, for instance, Infor customers. Right. Um, right. You frankly hear it a lot, you know, from Oracle customers right. trying to avoid right. the modifications. So, mods can drive value for your business, but they can, in the cloud world, in the cloud era, they can really create problems for you. And, and, and everyone thinks that they're special, but the reality is, is a lot of processes are repeatable across businesses. And actually, if you're sitting as a, as a SaaS software provider, you see it across a lot of customers, try to go with what's the standard out of the box with basic configuration changes and try to keep away from the customization. Or, you, or like you said, you can get yourself in serious trouble and not really take full advantage because you want to take advantage of the upgrades. You want the security upgrades. You want the functionality upgrades. You want the latest plugins from the ecosystem. So stick with the core and try to really avoid. And if you've got stuff that needs to be you know, kept up and it's old and it's legacy, you know, try to uh, shield it as much as you can from kind of this new age application. So we're here for three days, theCUBE, Knowledge17, uh, hashtag no17. Uh, and so we will be covering uh, all the innovations. You know, the, it's an interesting conference because the roles here are IT practitioners, CIOs, line of business professionals like those within HR and, and other lines of business. So really a diverse crowd. Uh, there's a developer conference, a lot of events within the event. Uh, there's a Women in Tech uh, luncheon tomorrow hosted by John Donahoe, so a lot of stuff going on that we're going to be covering, Jeff Frick and myself. Uh, we are going to be right back with John Donahoe, the new Donahoe, the new CEO uh, of ServiceNow, uh, coming fresh off the keynote. So keep right there, everybody. This is theCUBE. We're at Knowledge17. Right back.